Uh, good evening, ladies and, well, let's just say gentlemen, uh, to another meeting of the Libertarian Alliance monthly meetings on Mondays, the second Monday of the month, at approximately 700, or rather 1900 hours, 7 o'clock p.m. in the afternoon, as they say in the army. Um, welcome one and all. Uh, today's emergency speaker, filling in for someone else, is David McDonough, and the topic of his talk is... Liberalism and nationalism, or the reverse, nationalism and liberalism. I don't think it makes much difference. Uh, what I wanted to do in this talk was uh, have a look at the fact that the national, that the nation is, a, 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 I think, a, a real sociological entity, and that liberalism somewhat clashes with it. You know, I think nationalists uh, have got a, a grievance against uh, extreme liberalism, saying that it causes all sorts of problems. They can say it causes all sorts of problems. So I think it does cause some problems for the nation. Uh, and so uh, you could take the uh, the uh, Whiggish sort of line you know, that, they, that the Whigs used to take on uh, progress. You're more or less denying that uh, there's anything but a, a tremendous progress. And if you if someone talked about uh, some demoralisation or some mugging going on, or or, so, or perhaps some uh, something declining in society, that's, they'd want to belittle it and, and, and say, really, this this uh, progress. And uh, some libertarians take that line on, uh, on uh, uh, the complaints of the nationalists. Uh, they say, oh, well, there really isn't certain problems and so on. Uh, but I think that that's uh, wrong. I think uh, we ought to admit that, the, the, that there is a... Uh, it doesn't have to be a clash. Uh, perhaps, given the... It depends upon people's values, of course. If people, uh, uh, exactly, if people actually value the nation as such, and everyone values the nation as such, then, of course, uh, there doesn't have to be a clash between liberalism and nationalism at all. Uh, similarly, uh, there doesn't have to be a clash between liberalism and conservatism if everybody uh, values the nation, uh, sorry, if everybody, if everybody values liberalism and uh, liberalism becomes the status quo, then, of course, liberalism will become a conservatism. Uh, you know, it, 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 you know, because the liberal idea, although you'll have, people might be able to argue against this position, you'll still have rapid change by the market, so that's say what sort of conservatism is that um, that's one argument I suppose that you could use against this thesis I'm fully forward but um, I, I still think that uh, it would make sense to say that uh, the liberal in a liberal society would maintain the status quo i.e. the free market uh, liberal order and in a sense would be a conservative and in a sense something like that has gone on in America because uh, what we had in 1776 was, of course, the Whigs, who were the forerunners of the Liberals, um, breaking away. And uh, the whole of the Whig party in this country uh, supported this uh, breaking away of the American in 1776. Uh, and uh, so there was a, 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 an argument and a debate in Britain as well as in America. And uh, the, in the wake of the uh, American uh, takeover, the American independence movement, uh, what happened is that Tories tended to go to Canada. All the Tories tended to go uh, up, up to Canada because they uh, largely supported the Crown in that particular day, debate that was going on on both sides of the Atlantic. So the Tories tended to... No, you know, it's a bit like the movement of, uh, of uh, Muslims to Pakistan in 1948. You, uh, you, you might still point out there's more Muslims in India than there are in Pakistan. So Some people have pointed that out. I'm not sure whether that's true or nothing. At least check it now, I suppose, but... Uh, there was one time when there was still more Muslims in India than there was in Pakistan, notwithstanding the movement. Well, likewise, there might have been one or two Tories that remained in the United States of America. But basically, a lot of Tories did go. Uh, and you certainly had a situation where both political parties were Whiggish in America uh, after the uh, 1688. Likewise, in, in a liberal society, you would have, um, I think, you know, you'd have something what you might call conservative. Now, actually, this is quite germane to part of what I want to talk about, because I want to talk about two groups that opponents of uh, libertarianism seem to conflate with libertarianism itself. But uh, one group, uh, which I have to mention now, uh, considering I've said all that about America and uh, conservatism and liberalism, are the neoconservatives, which many people tend to correlate with us, but of course they have very great differences from libertarianism. In fact, they, in many ways, the polar opposite of libertarianism. And then there's uh, another uh, group uh, that uh, 
I want to talk about, and they are the people who uh, uh, think that um, yeah, they're being called recently left libertarians. Uh, they're being uh, they're the group who think that there is no uh, necessary uh, clash between libertarianism and nationalism, uh, and they tend to think that anything that's not national is not liberal. Although they don't say it in that way, they almost do say it in that way sometimes. They're, they're, so one of them is uh, one side is. Not well, actually, not all that well represented by all Sputin, Roger Sputin, I'm going to talk about. In one, uh, um, and uh, the other side is better represented, I think, by Hans Hermann Hopper. Um, and um, so they're the two people I'm, going to, they're the two people I'm more or less going to talk about. They're the two people I've talked about in that big essay. That's uh, I haven't got enough notes from. Uh, so I'll send into the list in the next few weeks or so, I suppose. Uh, so... Um, First of all, I suppose, with the, uh, uh, the uh, neocons, I suppose. Uh, but of course, I might, might point out uh, uh, that Milton Friedman once said that uh, the market can do anything uh, better than the state. Um, uh, but uh, it, there might be an exception with, the, uh, with war. Uh, I think Friedman's uh, right that the, uh, although, of course, uh, you know, some of you may well object to this, uh, but I think that the, the, the market will not be better at the problem of defence than war. I think this is so conspicuously the case that, uh, again, I, I fully appreciate that you might not have that perhaps no one will agree with this in the room, uh, but uh, I think this is so conspicuously the case that you won't get rid of the problem of defence, which I think is caused by the state, until you've actually got rid of the state, or at least until you've winded it down. I think... Cobden and Bright were probably right uh, when they thought that a very minimum state would get rid of the problem of war. You know, the, uh, I think I'm certain, that, or I feel certain that the uh, liberal thesis that the market crowds out war is right and that taxation allows war back in. In other words, you can only have war because of taxation, because the market is taxed. And, of course, there is um, uh, this tendency of the market to go against war. It's even felt uh, while we've still got a state... I mean, Reagan, for example, had to make a tremendous effort uh, from a nationalist point of view to uh, get the uh, army back up to date because the, uh, the status quo, even in America, the status society, uh, was, to let the, uh, was to let the army dwindle and uh, fall behind. And you've got that to some extent. In Britain, a lot of nationalists complain that uh, too, ma- too many of the cuts are going on the army and so on. And uh, there is this tendency to uh, uh, let the army dwindle. But there, I think there's been this tendency throughout uh, civilization. Um, I saw an interesting program on the television on the Great Wall of China a, a few weeks back. And uh, this was talking about how uh, the Ming dynasty in China were very prosperous and they neglected defense. Consequently, they became very attractive to the Mongols and uh, they were invaded and. Uh, on one invasion, the, uh, they, over, they even almost came into the Forbidden City and uh, they were persecuting the people so much uh, that the doors had to be opened to let as many of them into the Forbidden City as could fit in. And the, uh, many of the rest perished uh, at the uh, hands of the Mongols. And uh, so the emperor was um, convinced that he would have to uh, do something about defence. And so he, uh, he, he, first of all, he uh, executed his war minister for uh, allowing uh, the, the Mongols to, uh, to uh, get so far as it, it got. But um, it wasn't really his fault. He, he hadn't been given enough money. He'd been starved of money. And uh, he, he knew that if uh, the Chinese army faced the Mongols, they'd have been wiped out. They weren't well equipped. So he, he needed more money uh, for his army. And the new, the new general, there was a fairly young general who we appointed in his place uh, called... Uh, Chi Chi Wang, and uh, Chi Chi Wang uh, first of all trained up the uh, army in the south against Japan, and then he uh, uh, at first the, uh, his army was uh, met some defeat against Japan, but he, he trained them uh, not to uh, to he, well actually he instituted the very uh, often nationalist thing of uh, you know Stalin instituted uh, instituted at Stalingrad I think. That if you retreat, you will shoot you. So basically, you know, encouraged them. They knew that they, <laughs> they'd have to fight because they'd have to die one way or the other. They might as well die 
fighting the Japanese. But anyway, he had some success against the, uh, Japan. And then he moved up uh, his army up, his now blue trained army, which he made professional. He found them part-time army, he made them a, a fully professional army, and uh, he got funds for that. But then um, the emperor wanted him to t tackle the Mongol uh, problem in the north, and he, uh, he, he thought that he couldn't do it because he had a look at uh, what, what had gone on, and he realized that uh, pursuing the Mongols into Mongolia meant that uh, you'd have to resort to their tactics of, uh, of uh, uh, raiding the uh, indigenous countryside, the Mongol countryside, and uh, he didn't want to resort to that. So, uh, so he didn't want them to, to do as they'd done hitherto either, that is to come into China and uh, supply themselves uh, from the Chinese countryside. So he knew there was this problem that if he didn't go in for raiding of the Mongol countryside, which was not all that rich anyway, uh, he would uh, really saw that the earlier generals that had done this had uh, got themselves cut off from their supplies and uh, sooner or later they was in trouble. So what he wanted to do was to bring the uh, Mongols into China. So uh, he built this great wall. He took, uh, he had uh, 20,000 people building it, and uh, it took, uh, uh, they had uh, five years to do it, so they were given five years to do it, so they had to work day and night, and of course a lot of these uh, 20,000 came from all over China, and they thought, they rather thought they were working like slaves um, on this wall, they worked day and night, and they were, they, as far as they were concerned, they were from far south of China anyway, and the Mongols were nothing to do with them. So he, uh, Qi saw this as a problem, and he, uh, he solved it by, uh, cultivating uh, a community uh, in the army. Instead of having just barracks, he decided to uh, try to encourage the troops to move their families up. So he, he made a, a, a community around the Great War, uh, both in building the war, which went on, in fact, he never did finish it, and, um, and also in manning it. And so uh, then uh, the war was ready, or parts of it was ready, uh, by the time the, the, the Mongols came back. And he, he was quite successful uh, because they was able to see when they were coming and they was able to uh, prevent them from uh, the wall itself and the troops on the wall prevented them from uh, supplying themselves from the uh, Chinese domain, as it were, and they were able to go out and meet them and uh, meet them more or less without having their own supplies being cut off. Uh, but of course all this cost hell of a lot uh, it, uh, and uh, it uh, cost, in fact, three quarters of the revenue of... Uh, of the uh, Chinese uh, government, and so uh, there was a. Uh, uh, they didn't like this. Uh, it was, one would ask whether, it was, whether this uh, solution to the problem of defence was worse than the disease. Uh, so, uh, what happened is that there was a fraction in the court who actually uh, s said that uh, Qi was using this uh, Great Wall and the army so he could take over as emperor. I think this was a lie, but uh, the emperor thought that it was logically possible and decided to sack Qi to prevent this from this logical possibility from happening. But my point here is this, that this solution to the problem of defence was extremely expensive, and the whole problem of defence is extremely expensive. Um, uh, it has been said by uh, many people that... Uh, <laughs> all in the Libertarian Alliance, actually. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, I give credit to what they said that um, Bill Gates couldn't support the war in Iraq for very long out of his own personal fortune. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, but what can support the war in Iraq is the taxpayers of America, which there are many of them, of course, and uh, they can uh, support it for as long as it goes on. Uh, but of course, it's not doing them any good. Even the United States of America are being heavily taxed by this problem. In other words, the, the big thing that the... Uh, state seems to outpace the market on is this problem of war, but it doesn't do it economically or uh, cheaply, and nor does it uh, cease to be a problem, uh, uh, you know, however it solves this problem, whether it's victorious or, or, or whatever. Um, and of course it is a problem that, that, it, uh, that the state itself po imposes upon, uh, on mankind, and as Cobden Bright probably said, that if you uh, Roll back the state to a minimum state, um, and kept it. Uh, Cobden and Bright also advocated that there should be no foreign embassies and no foreign meetings, no conferences, uh, 
that politicians should uh, just take care of national business, there should be no foreign office or anything like that. If you have a minimum state like that, which just uh, does what the classical liberals wanted us to do, and that is take care of uh, uh, defence uh, and uh, take care of uh, policing and stuff, and they actually they actually even included Covenant Party especially, but not John Stuart Mill, uh, education. Uh, so they included one or two things. They did think that the state, they didn't have, a, have the Libertarian Alliance outlook that the state is a, a positive menace. They did think, in a sense, that the state was okay. But nevertheless, they did see it as the, as the cause of war. And uh, if you rolled it back to a minimum state, or even better, to um, uh, got rid of it completely, got rid of states completely around the world, then the problem of defence would just dissolve. And that would be a, a huge saving to mankind. Um, so, the, but the neocon, of course, neocons, of course, when uh, we were supposed to be free markets, of course, it must be pointed out that neocons are very often favour a fairly large welfare state. Uh, so, but you know, the, uh, the uh, most opponents of uh, libertarianism or classical liberalism, you know, as long as someone's advocating the free markets, uh, yeah, they, uh, it's near enough for them. I mean, they even think, and they've said repeatedly that uh, the reforms that. Uh, have been undergoing under the uh, of the National Health Service over the last 10, 15 years have been something to do with markets. <laughs> of course, you know, uh, that is not uh, strictly the case at all. Uh, and one uh, wonders what they mean by the market. Um, you know, there has been some effort in the National Health Service to make it a bit more accountable. I suppose that might have something. You know, the, but the market, of course, um, makes it uh, accountable in a free way. Uh, and... Uh, in a polycentric way rather than in a central way. And of course, the, uh, all the reforms are quite centralised and in the ability that we increased the bureaucracy of the National Health Service. Uh, but, so, but so the neocons then do have this idea of a welfare state, which means that they're not libertarian at all, and indeed they call themselves neoconservative anyway. But they do say they stand for the free market and for free trade. Um, but, they are, but they openly say, after a bit, that uh, if you read any of their stuff, that uh, they are more interested in international order than free trade, and a lot of them. In fact, we had a friend uh, who was, I think, more uh, libertarian than uh, neocon. He used to often praise the uh, British Empire, uh, and um, he said that it was much missed and that it was uh, uh, abused by the Americans until it was gone. And then when it had gone, they missed it. Now, as suppose the neocons. I have this sort of idea that they did think that the uh, British Empire uh, did a, a valuable job in the world. And of course, uh, you know, there's something to be said for this. I mean, the British Empire was uh, very often far more liberal than what's replaced it in, in many respects. Uh, and uh, in Mises' book, Socialism, he actually eulogises the British Empire uh, at a great length. And, uh, and you know, many of his statements are, are true. You know, some of them are not. But of course, the classical liberal position of the British Empire uh, was that it was a, a complete uh, waste of the taxpayers' money, and that it. Uh, uh, but it was quite the opposite of the normally politically correct view, which is uh, that the empire was uh, you know sucked dry in order to make Britain a great nation. Um, Cobden, I think, had a more realistic uh, outlook on the empire than that. Which would mean that it was sucking the British workers dry, or at least it was taxing the British workers more than the, what they would have had to be taxed if you didn't have the empire, and that the Indians could, old civilization could look after themselves, uh, you know, for, far better than the, the British could. Uh, and so, you know, the classical liberal view of the empire uh, is uh, was quite hostile to the empire all along, and indeed this was a continuation of that debate going on in 1776 that I mentioned, you know, where the Liberals then, or the Whigs then, were uh, in favour of uh, the United States of America going free to a large extent. So um, the neocons then um, think that uh, they very often, if you argue with them, and I have argued with them on these various uh, lists that I'm on in the internet, they often say, well, you, uh, they invariably start off by saying, I used to be a libertarian too. Uh, but uh, uh, I've now realised that the, the, in today's world, in the real world, certain things have to be done. And what they mean is this international law and order business. If the United States doesn't provide this international law and order, who will? 
and we won't be able to trade abroad and so on. And the oil is important after all, you know, and so on. And uh, well, I think the liberal answer to this is that the indigenous people will, uh, you know, around the world will eventually grow up and, and uh, they'll find, you know, and they'll, they'll soon uh, look after uh, what law and order needs to be done and they'll see to it that uh, sooner or later trading will be uh, facilitated uh, uh, on, an, on an international basis without any imperialism or any neo-imperialism. Um, but anyway, that's the, they're basically the neocon. Uh, are uh, pro they're not exactly uh, up front pro imperialism there is of course a fellow who started up uh, a new series on television now on the Sunday nights uh, and it's, started, it's one of many series Neil Ferguson who is uh, more outspoken in, in actually being in favour of a new empire than many of the Americans would be and this is because he, he admires the British Empire and um, he thinks the British Empire did a good job and he thinks that uh, he agrees with them that uh, such a job needs to be done throughout the world. And, uh, and that is, I suppose, the neo composition now. Of course, Ferguson has, you know, is some, sometimes uh, some ideas that might overlap with uh, those of the Libertarian Alliance and free trade, basically, and so on. Uh, but he, has to, he, he puts, as, uh, he tends to uh, think that that should be subordinate to, um, to this need for an international order. And this is the big difference between the, uh, uh, the liberals, the classical liberals and the libertarians and the neocons. Um, so uh, there's, no, there's another thing uh, I was going to say earlier on that, uh, in which the, uh, the state is uh, better than the market. Uh, uh, I thought uh, that, um, and that is uh, in, uh, in persuasion. Um, you know, the, the state is, uh, the market, of course, is, is held by many people to be tremendously uh, uh, persuasive in its ads and so on, but I, I hold that uh, ads don't uh, persuade people at all, except one or two ads that you might find in the Reader's Digest, long ads that aimed at persuasion. Most ads just uh, simply uh, uh, ring a big bell and call attention to the goods that's on sale. And this puts the final touches, as it were, to entrepreneurship. But even entrepreneurship itself uh, doesn't uh, persuade. What the entrepreneur essentially tries to do is to guess what people are likely to want. Uh, so I don't think the market is uh, very good in the... Uh, it's not very good in war. And I think it's not... Very, that's, of course, a personal opinion, which I don't expect anyone here to share. But uh, it's also, I think, not very good in um, the arts of persuasion, which is perhaps another personal opinion that no one will uh, ever share. Uh, but I think what, uh, what is needed, of course, is exactly what we've got, although it's not as efficient as it should be, and that is an amateur organisation to spread uh, uh, liberalism, and that is, of course, the Libertarian Alliance. Uh, it is an amateur organisation, and it, uh, <coughs> it is, uh, insofar as it does uh, attempts to do this, I think it's quite good. It doesn't do enough of it, of course. The members have never been as active as perhaps they should be, uh, but uh, they are the sort of people who, who will, I think, um, get the uh, the ball rolling if, uh, to institute uh, liberalism and will persuade people. We can't expect the businessmen or people like that. And of course, as Mises points out again and again, uh, liberalism isn't, as the Marxists tend to think, uh, or, and as the sociologists who, uh, who like Marx tend to think, the ideology of the uh, businessman anyway uh, yeah, the businessman uh, is perfectly all right, but uh, he's not a hero of any sort. Um, now, uh, I come now then to... Uh, you know, I don't know what. Uh, I think I, uh, uh, I come now to... Uh, it's, it's a few notes I've got. Uh, I, think I come now to Hoppy, uh, who, set, who basically holds that there's no clash between pure liberta libertarianism. He even claims to be an anarchist, which is very good. Uh, he calls it a natural society, in fact, and by a natural society, he means an, an, anarchist, an anarchist society, a liberal anarchist society, an anarcho-liberal society. He thinks there's no clash between liberalism and nationalism uh, because he thinks that uh, the sort of things that um, upset the nationalists about free trade, like free immigration and so on and so forth, only happen on the scale that they do today owing to the state. If you had a complete uh, free market, 
uh, people would only be able to immigrate in, as they were invited in. Uh, there'd be no uh, highways. He has a look at the various public, uh, publicly owned highways, and he has uh, the idea that uh, the state has only uh, developed these so they can control the taxpayers. So they have. He, he notices there's virtually no houses that aren't uh, surrounded by uh, either highways or parks, public parks, and he reckons the state have these. So they can get access to uh, anyone who they disagree with, and uh, and perhaps um, uh, aid them to disappear in the night. He thinks this is more so uh, the case in socialist societies than it is in in liberal democracies. But he's written a big book called The Guard, uh, Democracy: The Guard That Failed, and um, he uh, explains in one of the chapters there that uh, uh, that you wouldn't get uh, it, it with a complete uh, free market. You, you, you wouldn't get anything that uh, the nationalists uh, protest against, like the multiracial society and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, he might be right on this. Uh, you know, it's a bit like I was saying at the beginning. It depends exactly on what the public think. Uh, you, know, you, you, have a, you certainly have a, what the statisticians would call a bell curve. And um, what Hoppy thinks is that... Uh, most of the people in the bell, uh, in the centre of the bell curve will be quite staunchly nationalist, I think. Uh, I would say that he, he must be assuming, reading between the lines, that he thinks that most people are in the middle of the bell curve would be um, a bit like the BNP are today. Uh, and, of course, if they are, were like, if that was the case, then perhaps there wouldn't be any um, conflict between liberalism and nationalism. But, my, uh, but I tend to think that the bell curve would probably... Uh, the, the BNP people will probably fall on the far side of a, bit of a bell curve, and then on the other side you'd have uh, you know, the politically correct people, and most of the people in between would be neither politically correct nor uh, BNP. And uh, so what you would get, I think, in a completely free society, but of course it depends on people's values. He's quite right in, in so far as what he says. Uh, you know, it's true that in the complete natural society or in complete anarchy, or even in a minimum state, a whole lot of these highways will be sold off and, uh, and uh, privatised, and a whole lot of these parks will be privatised. Uh, I think that's almost bound to happen, even in a minimum state. Uh, and uh, you know, the state won't have so much control over the public as it does now, and there won't be any of this political correctness, and uh, the BBC uh, will be very different from today's BBC, and so on, if it, if it survives at all. You know, Pat did tell me, Pat Skinner did tell me at one stage, and I, I took it to being correct, but it probably is, that uh, when the BBC started off in its first few years, it was, in fact, a private company. And um, th that's probably true. Um, and it will become, it certainly will become a private company again. It certainly wouldn't get <laughs> the state support if, if uh, uh, you had a, a liberal anarchy um, that it's got today. Uh, so whether, this, uh, whether uh, it, things would turn out like Hoppy or not, I don't know. Uh, but uh, I suppose it, it logically it could. I mean, it's, it's logically possible that uh, you know, there'd be no clash between uh, uh, liberalism and uh, nationalism whatsoever. Because uh, only a few people would be uh, inv invited in as immigrants, and uh, those few people would be um, would pay their own way, and so on. Uh, certainly, uh, e e everyone would have to pay their own way in the, in the liberal society. Uh, but uh, well, uh, and uh, you know, Happy uh, makes a, a lot of uh, formally correct points that uh, on how things will will be in the uh, liberal society. But he does have the idea that. Uh, that people will, uh, as I say, that the uh, the BMP type position, I think he thinks is, uh, I don't mean by the BMP type, uh, yeah, the BMP program of uh, of uh, taking the sort of measures that the BMP or the National Front might have liked to have taken. Uh, we can, I think we've seen uh, that uh, the most of the people in Britain uh, did reject that uh, when it was uh, an option in the early 1960s and in the late 1960s again uh, with uh, Enoch Powell and um, yeah, they did look at it and they rejected it um, so uh, you yeah, know but yeah, you could, if you could imagine a, a, you know, so I'm not talking about so I'm not talking about the, the I'm talking about having those values rather than if, uh, rather than being willing to use the force uh, because, uh, so 
I think you can imagine a society where there is no clash between nationalism and liberalism uh, as Oppie has it. However, I don't think it is uh, all that likely. It's far more likely that uh, what he thinks is in the middle of the bell curve is at one end and that the political correct is at another, as I said earlier on. And it's far more likely that you'll have more of a mix. And so it is far more likely that you'll have people uh, making the sort of complaints and being uh, upset as they are now. Uh, whether they want to do anything about it or not is is there. Uh, they, they they won't be so content. Uh, you'll be, uh, uh, so I do think that there is, um, you know. Uh, no, I think the liberal position to this is uh, on, on on this sort of thing is is to admit the problems as truthfully as we can, not to do the earlier thing that I talked about of the of the wig of saying that it all must be progress and there is no uh, hiccups along the way. Uh, and try to play down, uh, you know, things which uh, don't look like progress. You know, you see, well, Anthony Flew once called, uh, he, you know, the no true Scotsman thing. You know, that's the sort of thing I have in mind that I wanted to criticise in this talk. You know, that uh, we shouldn't say that uh, if there is something that people don't like about the liberal measures, then, oh, that's not really liberalism. You know, people do it with democracy all the time. You know, they say, oh, you didn't really have democracy at the French Revolution because heads rolled. In a real democracy, reds wouldn't roll. Uh, well, I, I I think that's fine. Now, you know, um, it, it could well be that you know, things go that if you had a completely liberal society, nations would vanish altogether. Well, you wouldn't say, well, it wouldn't, you know, as Oppie almost is sort of saying, well, if nations are going to vanish altogether, not many people like that. So perhaps that's not really libertarianism. You know, the real libertarianism would have a situation where you'd maintain the nation. So, uh, you know, the, so I want to say that he, uh, I mean, I'm saying that he might be logically right, given the values of the people, but if it is a situation that goes the other way and the nation isn't maintained, then it isn't the case that it's not liberalism. You know, the free market will be the free market. You will have individual freedom, and it's not necessarily, it may or it may not be compatible with the nation. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know it's, it, it depends on, what, on, on how people's values are, I guess. Um, so, um, well, I haven't talked as much about Oppie or... Oh, well, I was going to talk about Roger Scruton. Uh, I haven't talked as much about the near, uh, cons or about uh, Oppie as I do in, in the right-up to this thing. <laughs> but I've forgotten most of the details. Of Forthcoming attraction. For, for, yeah, which I'll send you to the list. But there's a, something I want to make... Uh, so, a few points I want to make about um, Roger Scruton's book, you know, this is, which I picked up England and Beef Nations. Um... Roger thinks that uh, uh, it's a bit like that Scotsman thing. He thinks that there is a, a relevant distinction to be made between patriotism and nationalism. And he thinks that nationalism is uh, uh, patriotism which is uh, pathological. Um, he thinks that uh, normal nationalism is quite peaceful. It doesn't concern... Uh, uh, thinking you're better than your country, just concerns having your country and so on. And uh, it's not, it's to be um, distinguished very much from tribalism. Um, and uh, he thinks that nationalism is absolutely essential. It's a wonderful principle because without it we couldn't have democracy. And uh, Roger thinks a great, great deal of democracy, of course. And he thinks a great deal of nationalism. Uh, now, I think that uh, what Roger's saying is uh, not too bad, but I don't think it's quite right because I think uh, what he wants to call tribalism and nationalism is, in fact, I think, uh, part of what the nation is. I do think that uh, there's something tribal about the nation. And if I was a nationalist, so I'm not, I've never had the uh, thought of as a Catholic, I suppose, which means universal. And then I went as a Marxist, which is also universal. And now I'm a libertarian, which is also universal. But um, uh, so my background is not particularly nationalistic. But if I was a nationalist, I, I, I want to uh, take the line that I'm taking with libertarianism here, namely that uh, uh, the aspects of it which are tribal and so on, I'd want to say, well, we ought to accept them as being national, just like I think that we ought to accept that liberalism might do some damage to the nation or to, uh, or to uh, things that might cause some headaches. Uh, uh, so, because I think that Roger's distinction between nationalism and uh, patriotism 
it is, I think, uh, uh, not totally and utterly valid because uh, nationalism will work best, uh, as Hoppy quite rightly points out uh, at length, as a homogeneous nation. Um, and uh, it is uh, a form of tribalism. Um, and <clears throat> so I think, uh, however, Roger makes a point against the, uh, he, uh, he makes two points against the European Union. Uh, one is that uh, they want to set up a super state uh, and uh, they're blaming the, national, the nation state for war. Uh, there's no guarantee that the uh, super state would be any better at, uh, at uh, solving the problem of war than, uh, than the national state. I think that's absolutely right. In fact, I, my own opinion of the EU has been, which I've echoed many times before, but go over it again, it's been from the beginning, right from uh, you know, the 1960s, that the, 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 uh, the common market or the European Union is uh, trying to solve the problem of uh, the expense, the great expense of war that I've labelled in this talk, uh, by having a whip round among the states. In other words, instead of Britain doing it on its own, it's now going to have Britain, Germany and France, and it's going to make it easier to pay the necessary expense of war. You know, the European state, and also there is the fact that the European state has got more population than America and could be the number one state. And I think that's uh, the tacit thing. It's the elephant in the room that the European Union... Although, although I, I do think that Heath was straight up front about this, but... Apart from Heath, all the rest of them don't seem to have been up front about this. And many people like Norman Tebbit couldn't see that, he couldn't understand that Heath was up front about it anyway. So Heath's up front about it was only recognised by a few people. Yeah, I think he made it clear, clear enough. Uh, and certainly if you look back at his speeches now, it'll be clear to you, I think, that uh, he wanted a super state. Uh, so, uh, so I think that's a good uh, point that he makes um, against the... Uh, against the uh, European Union. Um, I think his, um, his idea of the, um, of the nation, I think, um, you know, he's got, I say, as I say, I think the nation is real. He has a real substance to it, so he's got something to it. Um, I can remember, the, you know, I think that the, the Marxists never did understand uh, nationalism. They, uh, they did uh, think that class was, uh, was far more uh, real. And uh, the the uh, nations, and uh, of course that was completely false, as they found out in 1914 when uh, the Social Democrats went to fight the war, and uh, you know the you know, the, the, the Socialist Party was depleted, where because people went and fought for the nation. You know, the, the nation is certainly a, a real thing, and uh, whether it conflicts with uh, liberalism or not depends upon the values uh, that the people have in the future. Uh, but I think that, uh, prima facie, there's almost bound to be a, a clash between nationalism and liberalism. Um, and uh, when that does happen, I think the liberal propagandists has to uh, own up to uh, the fact that liberals do stand in favour of, say, free immigration and things like that. Uh, but of course, uh, Hoppy's quite right that, uh, uh, you know, with a liberal position, it may well be that uh, a population may well be, may well uh, of course, they wouldn't prevent free immigration because what he's talking about there is paradoxically a freer immigration than what we've got now. These immigration controls, what we've got now, although they might let more immigrants in, are in fact less free than the sort of things that Happy is nevertheless uh, being uh, loyal to uh, the liberal letter of the law insofar as uh, you know, he's quite wise at that respect. Although there's no end of attacks on him on the internet which you can only expect, I suppose, saying that he's a nationalist and stuff. Uh, but uh, he is quite... Uh, you know, he does make a fuss about uh, devolution, uh, probably to off offset his, the fact that he might be accused of being a nationalist, because obviously this devolution business is not very favourable to the nation. Um, and he... he, he uh, what well, up he envisages, uh, how we get from, um, from here to there, as it were, was first of all we'll have devolution and then we'll have privatisation. Um, I don't see the need for devolution myself. I don't think it's, it's you know, I don't think it's on the road to, uh, uh, well, of course, a natural order, what I call, what I call liberalism. Uh, I think that, you, uh, that, uh, that 
uh, we could, we can, and we should make a limited use of democracy uh, just to get more and more privatisation. And if we had a liberal population now, both political parties would have would would offer us um, hell of a lot of tax cuts. And of course, we take all of those. And uh, if, in fact, if we had a completely liberal population in Britain, we, I think it'd only take a few elections before we privatised most of the state off. And uh, we'd have a minimum state within 10 years, and probably even uh, a state of anarchy within 10 years. But what we're lacking, of course, is the liberal population. <laughs> Which, of course, is the big... Be a detail, I think. Be a detail. So with that, I'll open it for discussion. Very good. Well, uh, our speaker has set the ball rolling, a great globe of um, uh, interesting conceptions and, and possibilities, like the great globe itself. Um, I have first question. Oh. Is it possible to be a liberal and a very disappointed nationalist? In other words, you want the nation to be something or other, you think the nation is something or other, it already is, it's what it is, and that though you, are, you cannot but be liberal, because you think it's immoral not to be liberal, you think that the station, the nation that you care for, is going to be washed away or disappear or change utterly or something. Yeah. So you... you you can approve of something, right? I mean, you can you can you can think people have the right to build, move into the countryside, put bungalows on cliff tops, whatever it might be, but you deplore it when they do it. Oh, I think Hoppy would be. I tend to fear for Hoppy that Hoppy would be such a liberal in such a. In other words, I think Hoppy is definitely a liberal. I mean, as I said, try to. I think uh, I can't fault him on his on his liberalism. You know, he keeps to the letter of the law. He, 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 he skirts close to being a nationalist, but he's not a nationalist, and he has this success and devolution thing to cover. But I think he would be such a, a disappointed... Uh, yes, I think he's highly likely to be a disappointed liberal. He's highly likely to wish that people were more like Hoppy wants them to be. I don't mean so much as... Uh, I mean, to be like the supporters of power were, you know, they were not in favour of taking heavy measures against immigrants. They, were, they turned their back on that completely. Uh, and they, they, they wouldn't continent status far too much like Hitler and so on. Uh, but they did wish that there'd be less immigrants. <laughs> and I think you could have a liberal population like that who uh, didn't want, but nevertheless, as a principle, did tolerate uh, your free trade. Next question. No. Move it. Is nationalism... I'm going to put this... It's possible to be concerned only for your own population somehow, or at least more concerned or indifferent to the sufferings of faraway, slanty-eyed people, whatever it might be. No, I don't think these people exist, actually. I think most people actually sort of care for others, but they feel more inclined to jump for their musket when they hear that Britain has been insulted or threatened or the honeys on the, honeys on the coast or something. But don't you think that it isn't just a matter of... Because you're talking of values... Isn't there duff, duff theory as well? Isn't there uh, a certain economic analysis such that it makes people more of a nationalist and a liberal nationalist? In other words, it's not just valuing your home population compared to a foreign population. It's not just that. Well, you want think bad things to happen to other people, but you might like your own your own country's food or language or mostly because it's what you it's what you grew up with. It's not better, but it's what you know and love. Now that that will be closer to patriotism which is a kind of inoffensive yes. thing whereby yes, right. you love it because it's yours and had you been raised somewhere else you would have loved that so you don't run down the other countries yes. you just like your own but you want to have you want to have progress and development without change you don't like so but do you think that nationalism is and must be or actually existing nationalism is mostly illiberal simply because it has not so much the wrong values but the wrong theories Oh, uh, I mean, I finally do think that nationalism isn't illiberal at all in itself. It's only, it's a bit like religion, I think it only becomes very illiberal because it has a strong tendency to be statist. Hmm. And it's the statist part of it that... Where but why it is it? Comes. It must think the state is serving oh, its... Well, I, I, think, I think the, national, the state is part of the national ideal, yeah. You know, in other words, so, so, uh, I, think the nationalist, and I think a nationalist worth his salt would want his own independent state. And the nationalists will think the state is, is good. I mean, in a sense, Cobden was an, uh, a nationalist uh, to some extent, although he was an extreme liberal. You know, he, he was Englishman, and he, 
he wanted his own state. He wanted his minimum state, of course, but he did want his own state. He did think better of England than other places. He really, you know, wished well throughout the world and so on. Uh, you know, I think the classical liberals were, you know, I mean, I think most of the classical liberals were nationalists to some extent. It's only, uh, I suppose, the Libertarian Alliance has gone an arco liberal. Uh, at one point, I think I might have misheard or misunderstood what you said. You seem to uh, define um, left libertarianism as national as nationalistic. Is that right? Or, yes. Uh, I mean, do you think that? I mean, is that a necessary and sufficient condition of left libertarianism? Because that's not my reading of people who call themselves left libertarians at all. Well, uh, it's my reading of uh, Kevin Carson, and he's true. But I, I must say this, I haven't read much of their stuff. Oh, no, it's my reading of Kevin Carson is true. No, because there are a lot of people who call themselves left libertarians and they mean something. I haven't, read, I haven't read much of his stuff, but I've read one or two articles, and that's, that's my reading of his position. But I must confess, it's not a complete... I mean, my, my you know, understanding... I haven't read a lot, but my understanding is that it's something... I uh, mean, more like people who work for the Institute of Ideas or the XRCP, people who, who tend to believe in positive liberty um, are left, left, uh, uh, mainly left libertarians. Well, what oh. Kevin... Uh, again, I'm, I shouldn't really talk about Kevin Carson, but he's the best candidate, because I haven't read enough of his... Uh, also, I haven't read enough of his works. But what he seems to be uh, in favour of is a sort of uh, autarky, you know, national self-sufficiency... Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, this, I think, is a sort of nationalist. He's against free trade. Well, he, he probably, that's probably too rude, really. I mean, I probably should be more subtle because he, he probably denied that. I'm probably quite right on denying it. And, yeah, but what he, what he is hoping for is local production, uh, small, small time production, no, no, uh, very, uh, very, for, not for food to travel. He, he, well, he, he certainly doesn't seem to like what he, he might call globalisation. Some of the left uh, libertarian so-called, uh, that's because it's big business or corporatism. That's right, big business. Yes, yeah. that's, that's reflection. That they might claim to be cosmopolitans in one sense, but it's good for the cosmos, as it were, the human cosmos, that we all, they all buy local, grow local, that kind of verging into greenery. So sufficiency kind of idea. Yes, I don't right. know whether that's bundled up in it. Yes, I haven't read enough of them. No, no. My my reading of um, what Kevin, what's his name? Carson. He, I've read him less than you probably. But when he was having a go at big business, it was because he saw it's in, inextricably linked up with with the state and state mm. power. Yes. Yes. But he does. He does think that. Yeah. But but he, he also right. thinks. Uh, well, yeah, I do. It's actually the, in the thing that I've uh, in the notes at home. But uh, uh, he, 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 well, of course, the, the clever businessman will uh, exploit state power. You know, and uh, and uh, you know, he, he just adjust to uh, you know, he, he, a clever businessman won't uh, worry about uh, the source of, of uh, where he's you know, what you're paying. Um, uh, so, uh, but you see, what, what he seems to be doing, though, uh, I mean, I, th I would think I'd agree with him if he just wanted to say, well, let's just remove the state power. But he seems to think that, uh, he seems to hope that, uh, and he seems to think, actually, he seems to think, again, I haven't read enough of him, so I shouldn't really talk about him like this, but he seems to think that uh, it's impossible to have biz big business on a free market. I, I can't see why he thinks that. Well, there's the argument you can't have, uh, you know, um, uh, limited liability companies if it, were, if it were free, that kind of argument. We needn't go into that. But, so, I, I think that what you call a uh, nation would probably be better called uh, culture. And uh, I think that uh, a lot of people, for instance, uh, are very, uh, very fond and uh, supporters of their culture. Certainly, I would. I mean, uh, if there were no states, I would probably fund something like the French Academy and uh, you know French theatres and, and and things like that to maintain a culture that I'm very much attached to. Um, and I think that the problem with the state is that for a very long time in the 19th century, 
it found its legitimacy in the nation. And what meant, I mean, the support that people gave to the state was grounded on this idea of, of nation. Even, you know, Stalin uh, uh, was an internationalist, I mean, communism is an internationalism. Uh, when they were attacked by the Germans, they immediately became ultra patriotic to the point that they called the Second World War the Great Patriotic War. And I think the benefit of the European Union was precisely to start to cut the link between nation and the state, which weakens the state. In other words, it's more difficult to give your life to a state that is a pure, abstract, artificial construct. Whereas giving your life to the French state or the English state, I mean, the state that so many people have died for, uh, becomes something. So w w the, the reason why you had this attachment to the state was precisely because so many people had died for it. And the more artificial the state, um, the better. Ultimately, it becomes so artificial that you say, well, why do we have it? And um, so I think that would, you know, uh, probably we, today we should talk more about, uh, more of culture than of nation. Well, I, I think you're, you're right in what you say. However, I think if you talk to a stranger and you talk about culture, you won't know what you mean. Whereas if you talk about a nation, you will know what you mean. Even if you, even with the uh, nation-state ambiguity, you know, uh, if I was approaching this, I, I'd never use the word culture when I went nation, simply because I think most people wouldn't comprehend. You know, culture is, is a wide word that uh, it's a bit like nation itself. You, it's a blanket term that covers so many different things. Uh, whereas the nation uh, means something. Now, I think you can make the distinction between nation-state, uh, and I think I would. I think I would use those, I'd make a distinction between nation and the state instead of between the nation and culture, you see what I mean? Well, I'd hang on to nation for what you're really on about. I mean, this business. Cultural nation? Well, yeah, but culture has. People. I, I think culture is a good word to cross out of the dictionary, actually. I mean, it seems to mean nothing. It seems to be. A, it, when you hear the word culture, you reach for your eraser. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I admire, I admire it was the. Uh, the old uh, Air Force Nazi, wasn't it? Wasn't yes, yes. Who said, uh, yeah, who said, when I, when I uh, uh, hear the word culture, I reach for my gun. Well, I've always admired that. I've never liked the word culture. Well, the, the thing is that today you have more and more people who live outside of the territory that was assigned to their nation. I'm an example of this. Mm -hmm. And look at the Chinese diaspora. I mean, are the Chinese, for instance, living in London, uh, part of a British nation or are they part of a Chinese nation? Are the millions of Turks living in Germany or, you know, with two million uh, Arabs uh, from North Africa living in France, are they part of the French nation? Are they part of the Algerian, whatever, Moroccan nation? Actually, neither, probably. But they are certainly part of Arab culture. And the Chinese living here, or Chinese living in Singapore and so on, are part of the Chinese culture. And I think that is probably becoming more and more relevant as we have these pockets of migrants living in different countries than the country that their nation is, uh, you know, uh, allotted to. Um, the other part of what I should have answered to you as well is, I'm not, I'm not convinced that the, uh, I think you're right about uh, people uh, liking their nation. Uh, but I don't think that uh, people have got a tremendous uh, uh, attachment to the state. I, know I don't notice a tremendous attachment to the state. I never have noticed a tremendous attachment to the state in looking at, uh, in looking at people uh, throughout my life. Um, what I've noticed is an apathy, tremendous apathy uh, towards the state. Uh, I myself, before I became interested in politics, uh, wondered why anyone paid any attention to it. And the question that I often asked myself in my teenage years was, uh, what on earth has it got to do with life? 
Mm. Yeah, these people, you know, Mr. McMillan and so on on television. What has he got to do? Who cares who wins the who wins the election? What's it got to do with anything? Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I was tremendously in time in England today, of course, to some extent. But but uh, but nevertheless, I think that what I felt then is the average feeling that I felt in other people as well. Uh, I mean, they knew the two things. Everyone I met knew two things. There's two things boring that you should never talk about anywhere. One is religion and the other is politics. Mm. Never talk about those two things because you're bored around it. Everyone knows that they are boring. And so so there was a... What all cause fight? But they, they were widespread mornings. Question over here. David, uh, didn't the classical liberals believe in, in national characteristics? Uh, presumably the nationalists do. Uh, they're, they're preserving values. Or but did the classical liberals believe in these national characteristics? Yes, I think uh, a lot of them did. Yeah. The, the, uh, Cobden actually uh, went in for all sorts of things. He actually didn't only think of uh, think that national characteristics were the case. He also thought that phrenology was correct. But phrenology was a phrenology. Phrenology. Yes, pardon. <laughs> phrenology. Uh, it was a phrase of, of how you could educate the food bumps. The bumps on your head. Mm. Uh, Yes, I, I think uh, you know, the, there was nothing in classical uh, liberalism which was anti-nationalistic. I think that that's, uh, that is uh, coming to the fore in the uh, anarcho-liberal movement and in the Libertarian Alliance, I think. How much does the idea of the idea of democracy or the, practice, the practicality of democracy have to do with the idea of a nation that somehow fits a country, fits a culture, fits a people, and... It's more convenient, or it would be wrong not to be the case, that they make the nation that gets a democratic government. It was, just a, if it, it, was it just a matter of, well, we seem to be more of a kind, we're more likely to settle, to agree upon a government for this area. We can't just arbitrarily include half of France, you know, because it's, it's as near as Scotland, or even nearer, so why can't we have a nation made out of these two uh, geographical areas? So, was it the fact that they were also liberals and Democrats that they had to have an idea of nation? Oh, I, I, don't, I don't think the classical liberals uh, questioned nationality very much. They questioned the state, but not nationality. But Spruton uh, puts forward an argument in this little pamphlet uh, that uh, democracy is absolutely, uh, the, the nation is absolutely vital to democracy. You have to have a common feeling of we, he says. Mm, it has to be a demos. And it has to be a demos for, the, uh, for, for democracy. And he feels that's, and he feels that he makes a strong argument uh, uh, for saying that democracy must be based, it uh, can only properly be based on nations. And he points out, of course, he's largely arguing against the EU. He points out that, uh, as we all know, uh, anyone, is that the EU isn't particularly democratic. It hasn't, it hasn't done so well on the democratic front. You know, uh, uh, a lot of the EU councillors are unelected and so on. And, and of course, the, 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 the uh, European elections aren't all that popular and so on. So he hasn't he hasn't done so well on the democratic point. So he's, he makes some strong points there. But how far uh, how far he's I don't know whether his thesis is right or not. I haven't given enough consideration. Well, I've been for the book. I haven't bothered to you know. He, he, you know so uh, I'm so uh, hostile to democracy of late, which I'm pleased to assist him as well. Give his talk. Yeah. And, uh, I, he, when I when I uh, when I was reading his argument that uh, nations are absolutely to. Uh, Needed for democracy, I tend to think, well, so what? <laughs> mm. <laughs> perhaps I shouldn't have, perhaps I should have thought of his theory, this, and I will do when I reread it, to think of whether his theory is correct or not. Who was the historian who wrote about the forming of the British nation? Colleen, was it? Linda Colleen. Linda Colleen, yes. Uh, to come back to Christian's point, the idea, well, I'm, I'm a Frenchman over here, a part of a French diaspora, all this French culture. Uh, when the balloon goes up, like in August 1914, you know, the German student thanks, ha shakes hands with his host, said, I've had a wonderful time over here, it's very unfortunate that we're going to war. Yes. He clears off back to Germany, the British student come out the other way. So in the same way, uh, the EU might manage to make itself uh, one political nation in the same way that she says that Britain did, by having lots of wars. So the Scottish troops would fight alongside the English troops, and eventually they'd all think of themselves as Britons, mm. which is not very encouraging in a way. So Europe might be a force for peace, but then it might make use of a few wars well, I think to become a mighty nation of its own, which some wanted it to be from the start, to mm. be over and against 
Well, I think America or I think well, I think the EU, I think the EU was aiming to attack the Soviet Union and reunite Germany. But of course, what happened is that Germany reunited on its own, as it were. And then uh, after that, but they, they 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 started looking a bit more. They became well. I seem to notice it anyway. Perhaps I, and this is a, perhaps my observation was one-sided. But they seemed after after the reunification of Germany to become a bit more anti-American. You know, uh, America was down the target. Well, it was safe for them. <laughs> they had less need of America, perhaps. Uh, they had less need of America, but also the, the war with the Soviet Union was less attractive because the prize had fallen into their hands. I think they could have won that prize dead easy. I don't think the Soviet Union would have. Well, you know, it probably wouldn't have come to war. It might have come to some sort of diplomatic negotiation. You know, but I think with the, I think they would have reunited. You know, United Europe would have reunited. You know what I mean? And I think the Soviet Union would have had to either back down, and if I think it was a war, the European Union probably would have, would have won it. But then I, I've always been a, a fan of the, of the view that the Soviet Union wasn't all that strong. In a recent survey, and I sent you uh, the, uh, an article about this, um, more than 60% of uh, white Brits thought that immigration had on balance been a bad thing. Uh, I mean, do you think this is um, a fairly superficial uh, view that they have, rather than something that will actually have any effect on, I mean, if we had a free market, it, it wouldn't actually affect anything that they do, they wouldn't all choose to sort of clump together or, well, it, or exclude uh, anything? Or? It depends upon the population's values. If they, so I, th I think if, if, if they are 60% or more than 60%, they could have a happy like solution where they can solve it by the free market uh, but if there are enough people to upset that then of course uh, liberalism will cause those people real problems and uh, you know I, I wouldn't think that it was superficial no I think they're suffering real problems and the, pro the nation is a real thing and uh, you know they, they uh, have a grievance against liberalism to some extent yeah that's what I wanted to say I mean I think they have a I don't want to use the word well I, I'm using it you could say they have a legitimate grievance against liberalism. They've got, a mo they've got a reason to moan mm. uh, for, for liberal success. And uh, instead of saying, well, it's not really liberalism, uh, uh, you know, which Hoppy tends to think, uh, well, it's true that now it isn't really liberalism, but liberalism could have the same result. It could well be that, uh, that uh, you, know, uh, you could even get more immigration with a with with completely free market. Depends upon people's values and so on. And how they go, and of course, uh, uh, you know, there, there'll be that price to pay, that sort of price to pay, which can be blamed, onto, 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 even onto the liberty, even onto the LA. <laughs> you know, and so you know, I, I think that we ought to, if that is the case, I think we ought to say fair cup of you know, it, It's true that we are, to some extent, responsible for that, if, if it is completely liberal. But I agree with Oppie now that it, presently it isn't liberal. But a liberal situation could bring about that sort of result, in which case that would be part of the cost of being liberal, that you'd be partly responsible for that. You're saying you'd bear the cost of disassociation? And you'd have to admit, I think, if someone comes into, in some, come into a problem and said, well, you're one of the people who've advocated this bloody this outcome, I think I'd have to say, yes, you're right, I did advocate that outcome. It's, well, I mean, it's one of the things that... Um, uh, Layard, Professor Layard um, admitted in a talk he gave at the, uh, uh, the Italian Cultural Institute was that people who were um, ethnically homogeneous were much happier than people who were ethnically diverse. Yeah, well, it's and uh, given that that's a fact, it looks like it's almost bound to be reflected into, if, if nothing else, uh, some sort of system of voluntary apartheid to some extent, where people they choose to live in communities that they like maybe they might go right down to, you know, this is where all the poles live because they like to live together. That's, you know, that's, well, that's Hoppy, Hoppy right. makes that point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hoppy makes exactly that point. And uh, I'm saying it could be wrong. I mean, I'm saying that we don't know whether he's right or not. It depends upon the values of the people. But it, it could be right. But it partly happens now. Yeah, uh, well, it does indeed, yes. Oh, well, Hoppy makes that point as well. Uh, you know, he makes a lot of good points. Yes, but um, this point, isn't it 
I think Christian is more right. Is isn't that more culture than than nationalism? Because that that happens on a very small area. I mean, you could then have a lot of nations within uh, within an area like London, where, where you know you have one area where the Poles live, one where the Germans live, one where where English people live, and so on. I think this is more really going into the direction of culture and nationalism. I understand really putting. This, this whole idea of, of, of nation into the center of your political ideology. And, and if you do that, then you're ending up, and, and Hopper does this a little bit by, by arguing not just that, that, they will, that, that uh, similar people will, will, will sign up in, in one small new, uh, region, but also argues for immigration into the current existing uh, territories of, 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 of states. And I don't see how that can be prevented if you have, um, if you don't have a state, for example, if Hopper is an anarchist, because I mean, who's de who's deploying and, 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 and who's who's paying for an army at, at the borders of, of say, like Britain, uh, to 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 prevent these people from from entering in the first place? Maybe you have some local conflicts that they split up within a, a smaller region because they just don't like to live among equals. But uh, nationalism and, and immigration in that sense can can never be prevented when you have. Um, when you have an anarchy, and, and therefore I, I don't see how nationalism can be uh, in, um, uh, nationalism and, and, and at least anarchism go, go together. Well, uh, you, you could, you see, it depends upon people's values. Uh, I mean, I think you're right, you, you, if, if people's values are, are such that they're willing to tolerate and try with immigrants, then immigrants will come in. But you could have what you had in the United States. See, the United States is uh, I mean, there's some rude things here. I mean, it was very rude of uh, the Gandhis to criticise South Africa and apartheid. It's also quite rude of the United States to criticise South Africa and apartheid because until the civil rights in the 1960s, they had a, uh, a, a position where... Um, um, there's a special word for it, but I've, I've forgotten. Jim Crow. Jim Crow, yeah. Uh, Jim Crow laws. And uh, you, know, you just couldn't get a drink in the pub if you were black. Uh, and so on, and you couldn't ride on the buses, the separate buses, and so on. And all that wasn't really particularly enforced by the state, it was enforced by the, at, at the local yeah, level. It, by was it. Enforced by it was enforced by the state. It was, it was, the state it backed it, it up. It basically it was imposed by the state, certainly on the bus companies yeah. in the south. And, it was imposed and, on the bus companies. And as far as I know, they enforced well, you, it after they realised that in, in the end of the 19th century, for example, in pubs, more and more. Uh, they became more, more, more uh, multicultural. That the people actually did break these these national barriers, and uh, some politicians didn't like that and said we, we need to have a law that forces pub owners to split these these these, these groups up. So I think the the market did set the exact exact uh, opposite example of peeping people at least in places like bars joining together. That doesn't mean that they maybe uh, in in their private life have deep uh, deep connections with each other. But um, there was a tendency of, of splitting up these, these, these racial splits, and it was the state who then tried to reinforce these, 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 these splits. From yeah, but I don't, think, I don't think you need to... I don't think... I mean, if, if the state did, actually, uh, Jeremy's right, uh, and you're right, I don't think you, uh, you need the state for that sort of thing. I think you can imagine that sort of thing going on without the state. That's, that's my point. And to some extent, it is going on even now in America now that the state has gone the other way. Now the state in America is even more politically correct than the state here. And yet, if you have a look at uh, when I went to visit David Steele in uh, Chicago, uh, one side of Chicago is completely and utterly black, and the other side is white. And in, in the centre of Chicago, you rarely see a black. I walked around Chicago, I didn't see one. Perhaps they were hiding from you. No, they weren't hiding from me. <laughs> <laughs> I would. I didn't even. Oh, you would, yeah, but you know me, they don't. Uh, good point, good point. Uh, no, well. Uh, they didn't even know I was visiting. I should point out as a point of interest that I believe in the medieval Paris, lots of foreign students attending the, uh, the university there, where they, where they lived, they were known as the nations. Each one had its little, That's right. its little sect. Mm -hmm. That's right. So they, you have a kind of um, was... voluntary nationhood. However, going the other way, back to culture again, a certain Mr. A. H. thought that where there was Germanic culture, there should be one one nation to, to surround them all mm -hmm. for their own good. So it, it can cut either way. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm rather skeptical about this idea of a British culture. I mean, if I look at what I do in my everyday life, um, I don't have anything in common with people who watch EastEnders or go to football matches. Or and I, I, I meet as many foreign people when I go to the Go Club weekend on a Saturday as, as I do British people. And they're there as Go players, not there as Japanese or Koreans or Chinese or Germans or Poles or French or whatever it is. Until the blue goes up. You're a sceptical of British culture because it hasn't got much go. Oh. Well, well you're, you're high culture. That's, that's what you put on your census form. It's in high English, like. <laughs> well, I don't think it is particularly British because the, the things that I do, I, I don't. Very few British people do it. There's, there's more people internationally who do it. I mean, if I go to the Go Club on a Saturday, um, there are going to be Japanese people there, and Polish people, and German people, and occasional Frenchmen. Um, <laughs> what is it the other days of the week? <laughs> well, the other days of the week, the place is, ah. is, is, is the Japanese club. It's a, I, thought you meant, I thought you meant he was only occasionally French. Yeah. That's facetious. Uh, Anything further to add, then? I don't think so. I think I've got a question. Th thanks for coming, anyway. No, no. no, no. Really good. Thank you, David.